This is Philly talk with Philly Mike. Talking sixes in the bird game, that's our life. Competition, we ain't scared, yeah, that's what we like. Win or lose, you know we showing up and we gon' fight. Uh, you see, we strive for the sky every day that go by. And every single week we scream and fly, eagles fly. This is Philly talk with Philly Mike. Yeah, this is Philly talk with Philly Mike. Yeah. What is going on, everybody? I go by Philly Mike, and this is the Philly Tall Podcast. And today we are here on Football Friday. This is probably going to come out to you on Saturday, though, one day before the epic NFC Championship game. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe. But we got one of the Eagle Report and Legends in the building, D Gun. How are you doing uh, today? Good, Mike. What's up, baby? How you feeling? Hey, I'm feeling as good as possible. I mean, we are the favorite team. I know sometimes the national media has been, you know, they make it seem like we're the underdogs, right? I don't know right, why, right. but it is going to be a clash of two great football teams. I just don't trust Brock Purdy when the lights get the brightest at the link. What is your just take on the young rookie coming into this environment? Well, what he's been able to accomplish, you have to start with the coaching staff. And Kyle Shanahan has done a tremendous job in terms of orchestrating an offense that hasn't changed this season. You think about it, it's gone from Trey Lance to Jimmy Garoppolo and now this kid. I mean, we're talking about a kid who was Mr. Irrelevant in the NFL draft this year. An afterthought, at the very least, lucky to be on somebody's practice squad. And all of a sudden, he's been one of the most talked about entities in the playoffs since the playoffs has started. And you, you look at how Shanahan utilizes him. He doesn't make this kid stand back there and think a lot. It's a quick moving offense. It's a quick strike offense. He doesn't have the strongest arm out there, but in the in intermediate game, he's very lethal and they've been very successful. I.e. he's a big reason why they've, they've won 12 in a row. The thing that really jumped out at me about him is you go back to when they played Miami and on the second series of the game, Jimmy Garoppolo gets the foot injury. He's out. They bring this kid in, and I'm thinking Miami's about to slam the door shut on him. This kid hits the ground running like he's been playing all season for him. Mm -hmm. And you look at the numbers he put up at the end of the year for an untested rookie who didn't get a lot of reps with the first team. 13 touchdowns and four interceptions, that's unheard of. But it's a great story. But he's coming into a house of horrors for him. He's coming in to face a defense that finished with 70 sacks, third most in the history of the NFL. He's coming in to face one of the loudest fan bases in all of pro football. And you know me, I've been in every stadium you can be in. <laughs> and I'm telling you, Philadelphia is right up there as one of the loudest stadiums in all of pro football. And he's coming in to, to face a tenacious defense. And now that we find out that Avante Maddox has been cleared to come back, that's huge in terms of having Maddox play the slot receiver and having C.J. Gardner-Johnson on the back end. So the Eagles are facing a, a repertoire of athletes they haven't seen all season. But the 49ers are facing a repertoire of athletes. They haven't come across all season with a quarterback who was heavily in the MVP conversation until he got injured and lost those two games. It's going to be an epic battle on Sunday. Yeah, I agree. And I definitely don't want to discredit what Kyle Shanahan was able to do. And again, Brock Purdy's played his role great. He kind of opened things up to start the playoffs with, the th with his first 300-yard game against Seattle, really cooked right. in the second half. Right. Now, he has no interceptions in his playoffs, and he's 13-4. Right. and four. Credit to him. But there has been some opportunities for the Absolutely. Cowboys, for Seattle. They just couldn't get their hands on them. And Kyle Shanahan, no matter how much we want to talk about Brock Purdy, he still wants to run the ball. Just me skimming down his game log, he has a couple games where he only attempted 22 pass attempts, 24, right. 23. And so that's the style they want to play. Now, this is what Jonathan Gannon, to me, got to shut down because they don't want to be in third and long. They don't want to have to throw the ball, you know, 30-plus times with Brock Purdy. Not right. saying he's not good, but because of what this Eagles D-line presents in a pass rush standpoint. So they want to keep it like that. How worried are you for the Eagles to stop Christian McCaffrey, Debo, use check in this run game to set up something where Brock Purdy got to beat us and not Kyle Shanahan's run game beating us? Well, you didn't even mention George Kittle, who's one of the most lethal tight ends over the middle. Nobody gives uh, credit to a young man named Jawan Jennings, who's a good compliment receiver. Ray Ray McLeod, another good compliment receiver. This is the deepest array of, of, of pass catchers the Eagles defense will, will see all season long. And I mean even deeper than Cincinnati or Kansas City if the Eagles do get to the Super Bowl. The key is here, the Eagles have to find a way to take away the middle of the field. 
Brock Purdy and Shanahan's offense like to work the middle of the field. And the reason they do it so efficiently is because of all the threats they have to the outside of McCaffrey lining up in the slot, they spread the field, which opens up the middle for either Kittle, which is a nightmare to cover, Mm -hmm. or McCaffrey wiggling, or Brandon Ayuk wiggling across the middle. So the Eagles have got to find a way to squeeze the middle of the field and force Purdy to throw more out routes to give Darius Slay and uh, James Bradbury an opportunity to jump a route, which could be a a momentum-changing moment for this game. But if if the Eagles can shut off all those lanes and that kid's got to stand back there and pat that ball more than an extra second or so. you got Hassan Reddy coming this way, Brandon Graham coming this way, Hargrave coming up the middle. You've got Fletcher Cox coming up the middle. You know, Mil- Milton Williams, Josh Sweat. You don't know where it's coming from. I mean, this kid's going to be under pressure like he's never seen before. He's been very good at being a Houdini-type quarterback in terms of spinning away from the pressure. The Eagles have to do a better job, as other teams have not, is having that backside containment stay disciplined. Wait for him. Force him to go one – force him back one way, back in two, somebody Mm. standing on the other side. Because when he's able to come back on the other side, that's when he has that wide open field, and that's when somebody wiggles free for him. But the Eagles have the personnel. I mean, think about it. On both sides of the football, the Eagles have all 22 starters playing in this game. Nobody can say of the four teams standing, nobody can say they're as healthy as the Eagles right now or as deep in the rotation. Uh, so this is going to be an incredible matchup. The chess pieces moving around are going to be incredible in this game. Yeah, I agree. And I was talking more about our our defense versus their offense because the media has been playing the whole the best defense versus the best offense. And and I do agree that's a matchup in its own, right? Jalen right, Hurts and our right. skill weapons versus, you know, the Fred Warners, the Bosa's, the, the Green Laws, the Ken Laws and all that. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the underrated storyline is how how good our defense with getting Avante Maddox is and how Absolutely. we can shut down that. But flipping it over to the offense, like – um. How do you feel? Jalen Hurts opened things up. He didn't have to do much. We were able to rest our starters in the Giants game. Yeah. How do you feel about this Eagles team attacking that Niners defense, which, you know, watching the, watch, watching the Seahawks game, they were able to move the ball a little bit. Watching yeah. Dallas, they were able to move the ball a little bit. Their turnovers is what's forced the Seahawks yeah. and the Cowboys into losing that game. But they were able 20-20 to 20 to move it. How, how do you see the Eagles attacking them this game? 49ers corners are a little bit above average at best. You know, they can't hang with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith for 60 minutes one-on-one if Jalen Hurts has time to stand back there and pass the ball. 49ers have not seen a dual-threat quarterback like Jalen Hurts since they played Justin Fields early in the season. Okay, so, and then when you, you couple in that running game, you have the best offensive line left in the playoffs right now. You have this dual-threat quarterback who's been in the conversation of MVP for much of the season. You have two 1,000-yard receivers, a 1,000-yard running back. <laughs> the way they set their scheme, you, you can't. You take out one facet, they hit you somewhere else. I didn't even mention Dallas Goddard. We talk about George Kittle. Dallas Goddard is just a nightmare for the 49ers opposition as well. The thing about the 49ers is you have to run right at them. Don't run sideline to sideline. They are lightning fast. Their linebackers are fast. There's the entire defense is short tacklers. They don't miss tackles when they get on. To me, Fred Warner is the best inside linebacker in the game bar none. But with his overall play. But you can take him out of the game. A a a, a Jason Kelsey can neutralize him. You talk about uh Nick Bosa, you know, leading the league in sacks with 18 and a half. Well guess what? Elaine Johnson can neutralize him. Now, I'm a little bit concerned if the Eagles try to throw the ball more than they run the ball. I think they should establish that run because if Nick Bosa consistently lines up over Jordan Malata, I don't like that matchup. Malata has played well in spurts, but the word inconsistent comes to mind when you're talking Mm -hmm. about Malata. And you're talking about a dude in Nick Bosa. To me, I've said it on my own show, um, Sports Talk with Rob Ellis and Barrett Brooks. We, We do daily from noon to three. I've said a number of times this week. Nick Bosa reminds me a lot of J.J. Watt. Nonstop motor. The dude motor. doesn't quit. He feels just. He looks just as strong in the fourth quarter as he does the first quarter. And I don't want to see the Eagles have to rely more on that pass more so than the run. Hopefully they can build a lead and use that game, the running game, to pound them between the tackles and wear them down, control the clock, keep the Niners off the field, and put this baby to rest and talk about moving on to the Super Bowl to face either Kansas City or the Cincinnati Bengals. But – In terms of just overall prowess, the Eagles have more depth, more versatility, more quality on the offense than the 49ers do on their defense. 
Yeah, I, I agree. They got playmakers, but like you said, that secondary can be tested. Absolutely. Um, I, I see them playing the box. I see them coming out the same strategy as we are. Like, I, if I'm JG, I don't, I don't know. I think the top priority is to, you know, slow down that run game and all their little motions and, 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 sh- and short yardage stuff. And, and again, make Brock Purdy have to beat you throwing the ball. And I think they want to do the same thing. I just think that our one-on-ones are going to be, you know, it's it's going to be very hard for them to stick with them, especially AJ Brown coming off the game. He did, you know, three catches, 22 yards. Right, right. I think he's ready to beast. Uh, he, he, he played the Niners last year and he had 145 yards. That doesn't really right. mean nothing, but right. I know he he's, he's destined to have a, a hundred yard game in these playoffs for sure. Um, mm. I'm with you. I don't want to, I want to be balanced for sure. No right. matter what the Niners do to our run, run game, you got to be patient. You got to stick with it. Cause Kyle yeah. Shanahan, he learned. From that big blow up ATL Super Bowl with Tom Brady, he learned to be patient and stick with his guns. We need to do that on our end too. But I do think there's some big plays to be had in the passing game just because I don't know how they're going to play these wide receivers. Uh and also watch Jalen Hurts. One thing I also noticed, and and listen, this this is the this is the game. If you lose this, you go home. So absolutely you you can't hold nothing back with Jalen Hurts RPO running. And and Dak Prescott was able to they were letting Dak Prescott run the ball and he's not a runner so right. I think you utilize that and you bring out everything and I do think the rosters are comparable they haven't seen us we haven't seen them but if you ask me quarterback to quarterback I'm going Jalen Hurts for sure oh, and no if you question. ask me roster I'm still thinking that we can we edge him out with depth pieces and especially as you alluded to all 22 starters healthy. Absolutely. Number one team in the NFL. I don't know why, you know, these these hot take shows are re- – I mean, listen, the Niners are two-and-a-half-point underdogs. I think that's still – I think they're, I think even Vegas is uh, giving the Niners a little bit more. For us being a home team and only two-and-a-half, you could even give us that three-piece. I think this is going to be a good one. But if any team has proved to face a, a just – Win a game no matter what. It's been the Eagles because we have so many different styles of wins from defense to offense to shootouts to struggles to clean uh, takeaway games. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to see it. The Eagles should have gotten, uh, uh, should have been favored by three points just on the quarterback versus quarterback play alone. Exactly. You know, you got a Jalen Hurts who, who was raw last year, but he got that playoff experience, improved his game tremendously by his offseason work ethics and workouts. Uh, every he checked off every box you could possibly check off uh, about questions that were asked about him, durability, able to read defenses, run the offense more efficiently, accuracy in his arm, arm strength. All those boxes have been checked off. Basically, you have a lot of the guys who played in that playoff game last year that still remembered how they got embarrassed by Tampa Bay. But oh, by the way, you went out and you added a whole lot of bullets to the chamber when you bring in a Hassan Reddick. <laughs> who's had double-digit stacks with three different teams in three consecutive years. You shocked the world making a trade for A.J. Brown on draft day. You bring in James Bradbury to go along with Darius Slay to have two Pro Bowl caliber cornerbacks back there. You continue to shock the world. You make the deal to get C.J. Gardner-Johnson in here, and then you found out your running game was like a a picket fence early on. So you go out, you call basically in Domica Sue out of retirement (laughs) and bring Linville Joseph. You know, there's a reason why Howie Roseman is the executive of the year. Howie Roman, Roseman has earned that right. He has had a, such a roller coaster ride with his fan base and the media for years, but nobody can say anything negative about what Howie has done to put this team in his position as having one of two of the best records in all of football and all the stats they've compiled, number one, number five at minimum in most of your, your, your key categories across mm-hmm. the board, both offensively and defensively. Yeah, uh, that guy who was holding the tech at the Texans game saying we forgive you, Howie. I know how he yeah, felt a little yeah. bit about that, but we definitely forgive Howie for some of the stuff. And like you said, like he said, I mean, yeah, I might have missed some draft picks, but we got a Super Bowl a couple years ago. Right. Uh, the first one ever. And I agree with you. Not only did we just go out and get these guys and they play to their level, they had breakout years. Hassan Reddick's best year, m- most sacks in his career, AJ Brown's most yards and touchdowns in his career when you combined them. Um, James Bradbury went from being, you know, an average. He was the Giants defense kind of messed him up last year, but he's back to being all pro. Peter Garner Johnson flashed over there with the Saints, but he didn't lead the league in interceptions. So not only do we trade for these guys who had who were playing good football in the National Football League, they rose to the occasion and broke out. It's just a tremendous job by Howie Roseman and and the job ain't finished, as Jalen Hurts will say. Um, But before I get you out of here. 
Can you give me your give me an offensive player and a defensive player that you think is going to break out and have a heck of a game? Now we know there's going to be multiple. We believe there's going to be multiple, but right. give me an offense and a defense guy who really stands out. Like when the game's over, we're like we these two guys were huge in this game. I wouldn't be surprised if the Niners try to double up A.J. Brown and try to take him out of the game. And if that's the case, Devontae is going to get a lot of one-on-one situations on the other side. So I'm going to pick offensively Devontae Smith uh, having a big game in his atmosphere. And on the defensive side, because of Hassan Reddick will be going against Mike McGlinchey, Philadelphia's own Mike McGlinchey, who is 6'8", 3'10", but has been the weak link on that offensive line. This could be a game where Hassan Reddick has a minimum three-sack game. I expect Hassan Reddick, who finished second in the league in terms of winning, uh, pass rush battles at 27.6%. He was only second in Micah Parsons. I ex- and you look at how he's come on in the latter part of the season and his array of moves. I, I expect Hassan Reddick to feed from that-, that side of the line of scrimmage and flush Purdy out and eventually catch up to him and get him. So I'll go with those those two players as players I think will have key input into deciding the outcome of this game. Hey, I I can't disagree with that at all. I think not only has Hassan Reddick been good all year, but he's played his best game down the stretch when it matters. He was active in that Giants game, and I think he has a great matchup, and he's going to take advantage of it. And if they shade coverage to him, that's the one thing. Um, Bosa led the league in sacks, but if you look at the defensive line and we try to categorize it, in this game, it's going to go Bosa number one, but number two, three, four, five is all Eagles. Because if yeah. you look at that, yeah. that 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 Niners team, they got forty four sacks. Bosa got almost half of them. Everybody yeah, else did. is like four or five, four or Absolutely. five. We got multiple double digits. So as yeah. soon as they start shading stuff to Reddick, that's when the BGs and the Josh Sweats and the hard all grades of, yes. all go to work. Yes, so indeed. I'm excited to that. Now I don't know how you feel about doing this. Do you do you, you do you got a score prediction for me or you? Yeah, I gave it to my uh, show Sports Take. Normally, I don't like to do score pre- predictions, <laughs> but when you when I look at this team, I think the Eagles' offensive line across the board is better than the 49ers' defensive front. Jalen Hurts, obviously, better than Brock Purdy. You're playing this game in the Eagles' backyard. Um, Brock Purdy has never played an East Coast game Um, in in his short tenure as the starting quarterback. First time he's played East Coast game at the NFL level. So the Niners got to come west to east. Uh, With all that said, I expect it to be a close game. And I picked on my show 28-24, so I'm going to stick with that. Eagles 28, Niners 24. All right, I like it. I I said just yesterday 27-20. Okay. But then I seen Avante Maddox. Then I seen Twitter with the Brocky. You know, they got the Brock. <laughs> not Niner Nation doing, doing everything they can. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking about bumping it down to 17, but I'm going to stick with my guns since we got D gun on here. Uh, 2720 <laughs> is mine. And I appreciate you for coming on. And hopefully, you know, we all got content to make of the Super Bowl that we're about to see. Hopefully that's what right, happens. Right. Yeah, man. Uh, I tell you what, if, if they win this game, which I, I think the Eagles will win – it's going to be epic in that stadium, just like it was back in 2017, in January of 2017, uh, 2018. And just like it was in January of 2005, this city is going to be epic. And I'm telling you what, Arizona doesn't know what's about to hit it with Eagles Nation heading down to Glendale, Arizona for this big game. Hey, I hear you. If you're watching, uh, uh, make sure you uh, hit that like. Um, you you are watching. That's why you listen to us. Make sure you hit that <laughs> like button, subscribe, and go check out Gun on One. He has, you know, he does the Jacob Media twelve to three, right? Yep. And Jacob also, Media Sports Take. Yep. And Gun on One on YouTube. Love having you. Appreciate it, a Gun. No problem, man. Happy to do it anytime. All right, we out. Peace. <laughs>